Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us today to stay curious. A day in history, March 14th, we're at 2023, where we're going to talk a little bit about Women's History Month and feature two, the two rookie astronauts who came back from the Crew-5 Dragon landing over the weekend. Uh, of course, Russian Anna Kirkna, and we've got American uh, Nicole Mann. You're going to learn about those ladies as part of our Women's History Month. And as we look at the beautiful space station behind me here, a picture taken a couple years ago, right here is the Bigelow. Yeah, right there's the Bigelow unit there. There's the cupola that everybody loves to look out of. And this is the backside of Kibo with the outdoor porch there. And some other features there you might notice on our beautiful space station that was just... Uh, We've got the seven astronauts up there right now. Who are they? Where are they from? How many people have orbiting the Earth right now? They're all men. The irony of it, March being uh, Women's Month, Women's History Month, uh, and International History Month for Women, is, um, let me put the picture up there, Marty. Where'd it go? There we go. Yeah, there we are. Um, is there's no women in space <laughs> for the month of March anymore. So we'll talk about that. Who is, when was the last time we didn't have any women in space? And who's the next woman to go to space? All right, stay curious. I've got that information for you here. Big shout out to Marty Winkle, my friend and co-producer on this program that we're approaching three years of broadcasting live on Facebook and now on YouTube our little program here about space history. Of course, the American Space Museum for over 20 years has been preserving the birth of the American Space Age right in its birthplace, Brevard County, Florida, where, where I'm sitting and Marty's at in our studios here inside of our museum in downtown Titusville. We're literally 10 miles from the historic launch pads of Cape Kennedy and Cape Canaveral Space Force now. So... We have got a big birthday today. Oh my gosh, Marty, I need my hat. I'm gonna get it. I gotta dig down here and get my new party hat because we have got a birthday to celebrate today like none other, okay? The oldest astronaut, living astronaut, Frank Borman is 95 years old today. Happy birthday, Frank, born on April 14th, 1928 in Gary, Indiana. He's the oldest living astronaut or cosmonaut. He's a rookie commander of the two-man Gemini 7 uh, and then uh, the first rendezvous in space in 1965 with the Gemini 6 spacecraft. And then he was commander of the first crew to orbit the moon, Apollo 8, in 1968. Uh, Frank Borman, uh, his good friend, um, uh, Jim Lovell is also alive. We'll see a picture of both them together. Jim will be 95 March 23rd, believe it or not. So uh, let's look at a little bit of, uh, about Mr. Lovell here and go forward there. Take his birthday hat off here for a minute. Uh, there he is in his Apollo 8 uh, Apollo suit there. Um, his romance with airplanes began when he was 15 years old. Uh, and he went to the Air Force. Uh, of course, he won many awards. He was a consultant on television shows and movies. Uh, and uh, we're going to show you a pop culture cool thing that he's on the cover of the Led Zeppelin II album. If you didn't know that, I'll show you that in a minute. Here he is at one of the Space Fests. I know the UCAC brothers have met him. Many of you space geeks out there that attended that beautiful Space Fest out in uh, Arizona, met him and, and dozens of other astronauts. And uh, he would, they would sign a lot of stuff for a fee at the time. Uh, during the Apollo, all right, one interesting thing about Frank, and, and uh, here he is holding up the Apollo. Um, there is his signature on the Led Zeppelin II album, all right. That's his picture there beside Robert Page and, and John Bonham's on the right there. They uh, thought it was Neil Armstrong, the art director, actually. And how cool is it to see him 
in his 80s a few years ago, uh, a decade ago or so, holding up that album that he just, uh, uh, you know, and I, I wonder if he knows uh, that Dazed and Confused is on that and a uh, whole lot of love and all them great songs. Uh, but anyway, what a cool guy. Of course, there he is uh, with uh, uh, Jim Lovell. All right, at some fly-in that they were at together there. Uh, this is taken oh, a few years ago, okay. And like I said, Lovell's going to be right behind him at age 95. One of the most amazing flights of all, I think, in the Gemini era. Uh, and, of course, I'm never going to forget this man uh, for the Apollo era, orbiting the moon. And uh, as the astronauts, Jim Lovell there beside him, orbiting the moon with him. They spent 14 days together. Just not, they went to the moon and back, all right. That was eight or nine days together. But then they spent 14 days together in the Gemini spacecraft, which here they are after 14 days together. They joked that they were going to get married afterwards, okay. Folks, just any vehicle you get in after this program today, that front seat, just look at it around you. And then put a spacesuit on, and then and then and then look around you again, and you're going to be in more room than these guys were for two weeks, without anything but a couple books to read. Uh, it's quite a story. The the spacesuits they had were designed to go out to the elements, so they were soft helmets and so forth, as you can see hanging off their backs. Uh, Fourteen days of being beside somebody, and and. Uh, bodily functions and boredom and sleeping and that yet trying to keep a spacecraft alive orbiting earth marty did you ever think about that 14 days that was stretching the life capacity of the batteries the um all the systems uh you could have been hit by a meteorite they're banging on the walls of this spacecraft just saying well out there's death on the other side of these these glass windows in front of me you know, is nothing but the void of space and, of course, the beautiful Earth below. So that is an underrated mission, Apollo uh, 7, where they spent 14 days together. Uh, uh, pardon me? Apollo 8. You just said Apollo 7. I said uh, Gemini 7. Yeah. They spent 14 days together orbiting Earth. Apollo 8 was about 10 days in there. And still best friends, as you see here, uh, in this picture, uh, taken a few years ago to fly in there, Jim Lovell laughing on the right there. Of course, Borman became a president. Uh, the reports are, and this is Andy Chalkin talked about this in one of his books, The Great Historian, that following the death of Gus Grissom, Borman became the uh, astronaut chief Deke Slayton's choice to command the first moon landing. And Slayton offered uh, Borman the command, and he turned it down. Uh, he said before Apollo 8, it was his last flight, and he'd retire in 1970. Uh, and Borman says, my reason for joining NASA was to participate in the Apollo program, the lunar program, and hopefully beat the Russians. I never looked at it any as any individual goals. I never wanted to be the first person on the moon. And frankly, as far as I was concerned, when Apollo 11 was over, the mission was over. The rest was frosting on the cake. Well, he spent 15 years in executive for the Eastern Airlines in the 80s and 70s, was in turmoil with all kinds of deregulation of the air and labor disputes and stuff. Uh, he owned a few uh, dealer, car dealerships in North and South Carolina and has lived a great life, obviously. Uh, well respected. He was on the important boards looking into Challenger uh, in Columbia and was in the background for many years. So... Uh, uh, he's actually had a cattle ranch in Bighorn, Montana. Some of you out there may have known that. And he and his son ran a Ford dealership in Las Cruces, New Mexico at one time. So happy 95th birthday to Frank Borman. All right. And we'll be talking about his best friend for life, Jim Lovell, here in a few weeks. Well, another birthday. Put the hat on. This is a pretty good, good guy. You, you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'd maybe not know him as Spanky. But uh, that's his nickname, uh, Mike Spanky Fink, born on March 14th, 1967 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He considers Elmsworth his hometown. He has 382 uh, days in space. 
and he's queued up to go on the uh, one of the Starliner missions. Not the first one, but the one that's uh, going to be operational, uh, hopefully within the next year. He's been moved around a little bit in the, as a Boeing test astronaut. He was going to be part of the three-man demo crew that they've cut back to two uh, uh, with, um, uh, that hopefully will be launching uh, in April. I think we're looking at. So that's SUNY Williams and a shuttle commander flew twice in a row, I think. No, he didn't fly twice in a row. That's Bowen, who's up there right now on the space station. Um, oh, the Boeing commander for the, their, their crew demo. Uh, name escapes me. It begins with a W, though. Wilbur, Warbur, something like that. Anyway, we're talking about Spanky's birthday here. Uh, Mike Fink, that's his nickname. He's he speaks Japanese and Russian. Uh, he's into planetary geology, degrees in aeronautics from Stanford. Uh, he's got uh, his 14th on all time list of spacewalkers with 48 hours and nine spacewalks. He's all, he's walked in the Russian spacesuit. Uh, there he is in his garb, uh, the spacesuit for uh, Starliner Boeing. He was a mission specialist on STS-134, the next to the last shuttle. And then he rode twice on Russian Soyuz spaceships, uh, and uh, which is cool. Uh, Expedition uh, 18 Commander in 2008. And at one time, he held the American record in space at 382 days, which was shattered by Peggy Whitson's accumulated uh, 666 days in space. So... Uh, happy birthday to Michael Spanky Fink, 56 years old today. Uh, proud Pennsylvania product there. So, All right. Well, let's get into uh, the uh, crew that we had just come back from space. All right. And there's the... Um, when I go back there, uh, th there we are. We got uh, uh, Josh Casada, uh, Nicole Mayan there, uh, the two in the middle. Russian, uh, there, uh, Kirkna, and then uh, Wakata, Jack says Wakata, and uh, they're all back safely on Earth after landing Saturday evening there, and we're going to feature the two women there and tell you a little bit about their extraordinary careers and who they are exactly in celebrating Women's History Month. These are two really amazing women. One, uh, we're going to talk about the Russian first, Anna Kirkna had uh, no ambitions of going to space, okay, and uh, let's beam her picture up there. There's Anna Kirkna. She's now 37 years old, but when she was 27, she was uh, picked as Roscosmos decided to carry out an experiment in 2012, the use of, uh, uh, instead of using um, military pilots, they were going to use ordinary Russian civilians, all right? And she was a DJ named Anna Rainbow on Radio Siberia Radio. If you can imagine that. Can't make that up. Marty, you got a comment? Someone knows that commander. Yeah, Tom Usak said Starline commander is Barry Wilmore, nicknamed Butch. Butch Wilmer. That's it. Thank you, Thomas. And Tom Usiak, and I didn't I'm not going to talk about this tomorrow, but uh, he was in uh, Kazakhstan launching norm thaggard this day in history when was that 1995 marty i think it was 1995 and uh uh i kind of knew that and didn't include that in today's uh stay curious so i'm going to talk about that tomorrow but i'm going to post something about that on facebook later today well the last space flight involving a russian woman cosmonaut took place eight years ago okay now tongue-in-cheek actually it occurred about six months ago, when the uh, actress Yulia uh, Parasild was shooting the movie Challenge, that's out. Okay, so uh, uh, but she was not a trained Russian cosmonaut. All right, uh, she was uh, trained and paid uh, paid her way to go up there. All right, so uh, yeah, Marty got me there. Ninety five is the Norm Thaggard trip to space, and we got to see Norm. Uh, uh, couple weeks ago actually so 
Anna Kirkna here, shown here. Uh, so she was a DJ at a Siberia radio. Uh, she joked with her friends to apply for this. But what she had that a lot of them didn't have was she was specializing as a technical engineer at a, a maritime academy. And she was specializing in uh, a master of sports. And she was also very involved in rescue missions. She uh, took a lot of education in uh, rescue and stuff. So Anna Kirkina become the uh, fifth Russian female cosmonaut to go to space. Um, there were, when she applied, there was 300 applicants, all right, out of this small group. 43 were women. Only eight made the cut, and she was the only woman. So she's the sixth woman in Soviet Russian space history to qualify for flight. Valentina Tryshakova, of course, is the first woman in 1963. Svetna Savaskia, uh, she was in 82 and then returned to do a spacewalk. Uh, Elena Kodova, uh, she was twice flown uh, on the shuttle in 1990. And the last uh, Russian cosmonaut, pure, purely trained, was Elena Surov. In 2014 and then we had the actress go up um, there is Anna uh, she uh, will be the first flight of a Russian cosmonaut on the crew dragon she was all right she's the first Russian to return to water all right uh, uh, ever with the splashdown uh, off Tampa in the Gulf of Mexico, the Russians always landed on in space. Okay, they landed on, on the land or on the shuttle. All right, uh, she's the 22nd Russian to fly on an American spacecraft. Uh, this is the second flight of a Russian woman on a spacecraft. Elona Kondokava flew on the, on the shuttle, Lannis, and. Uh, uh, she learned to fly in an L-39 aircraft, parachute jumping, isolation chamber, survival training, all right, and uh, she cut the mustard on that, so uh, very valuable asset, I'd say, to the um, Russian space program. There she is in her, after 150-some days of space, that's what she flew to space in. I like the neck, never noticed that the neck, uh, turtleneck thing on these uh, spacesuits looks like that. Kind of reminds you of a knight in shining armor's headgear. There's Anna in space doing some maintenance on the Russian laboratory there. And they had a Barbie doll. Mattel put out a Barbie doll. Uh, the doll was released uh, uh, with uh, her personality qualities that were inspired by that. Uh, and uh, so she's still involved in in all kinds of sports as an ambassador. And now she's been to space for five months. Uh, she will be in big demand in Russia there and hopefully maybe go to space again one day. So uh, celebrating women in space, Anna Kirkna coming back after a trip of 157 days on the International Space Station. Uh, and next we're gonna celebrate Nicole Mann. And Nicole Mann shown here is that she is quite an individual marty she's a marine marty and i've been noticing that on her astronaut blues she wears a uh the marine colors on her name and uh, every picture i've seen with her on that she's got that on there we'll see that in a minute let's talk about nicole mann here she was born in pengrove california and she is a member of the Wallachi. Uh, of the Round Valley Indian tribes in Northern California. Uh, she is the first Native American female to go to space. Uh, of course, our friend John Harrington is a Chickasaw Nation member, and we've done interviews with John, and uh, glad that he's visited our museum. He is the first Native American to go to space. Man's aviator call sign, a nickname given to a military pilot, is Duke. And Duke was the female commander of the Crew Dragon 5 spaceship. Uh, how cool is that? Uh, she is an athlete, a soccer whiz. She won all kinds of exceptional awards as a soccer uh, ace. 
Uh, she, um, let's see here about her soccer stuff there. She played on the Navy Midshipman Women's Soccer Team. Uh, she was the Athlete of the Year uh, in the Navy on that. Uh, and she talks about how being so obsessed with the sports. Uh, two years of training at the Women's Soccer Program. Uh, she was in NCAA Division One for the, the Navy program. Uh, and then, then she was flying F-18 jets, all right. Uh, and learning that, and she says that uh, one of the biggest lessons I learned as a Navy scholar athlete was balance and compartmentalization. It's challenging to juggle an academic workload, sports, and personal life. It teaches you to focus on whatever you're doing at the time and do it well. If you're in calculus class, you can't be worried about the big game coming up or your flying routine and vice versa. Uh, she was the N 1999 NCAA Woman of the Year finalist for the state of Maryland. Uh, quite a, a motivational person, a leader, their high school friends. She said she was a leader from the start, always striving to get to the next level. And, and here she became a commander of a spaceship. And then there she, she is with her husband and son. She's married to Travis Mann. Her, her name was... Uh, Anupu should put that up there. Nicole Victoria Anupu A U N A P U is her Native American Malaki heritage name there. Anupu and her husband's also in the Navy there and good looking couple. So tender there. There, her dad, her husband, and son uh, giving her a goodbye handshake as she went off to the rocket ship that was taking her to space. Uh, five months ago. So uh, uh, Nicole Mann is in the queue as one of the Artemis astronauts. Okay. Uh, uh, she, she, of course, she made it to the space station. Gorgeous view of the space station like I have behind me here uh, of the uh, 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 kind of the belly of it that usually faces Earth with the cupola off to the right there, just to the right of the two yellow, two orange starbursts there communication antennas I, I gather but uh, yes Nicole Mann is is uh, possibly one of the women that could go to the moon all right she could be a commander uh, she could be a moonwalker all right uh, she would uh, as a Native American woman that would click the two boxes that NASA wants to of female and a person of uh, uh, non-Caucasian heritage I think is what they they're thinking uh, and who is going to be the first woman on the moon? All right. Here are the nine women that are in the Artemis program. Okay. Nicole Mann, the upper right-hand corner there. Uh, when I've heard her talk about, she's really regarded very, very highly. Uh, my money's on Jessica Meir in the middle there, or Christina Cook. They did three spacewalks together uh, around Expedition 64, 63, something like that. Uh, the woman who has not gone to space, Jasmine Mowgli, there on the right, guess what? Yep, she's set to go to space uh, as a um, commander of a crew, the Crew Dragon in uh, August. All right, and where's my notes on that so I get it right? Yes, Crew 7 in late August, Jasmine Mowgli, or Moog Billy, M-O-G-H-B-E-L-I. I have to learn how to say that. Moog Billy. Her parents were Iranian, and she's born in Germany. She's a uh, American uh, astronaut, though. Uh, Crew Seven in late August is going to launch a NASA astronaut, an, an ESA astronaut, uh, Andreas uh, uh, Mogensen of Denmark, a Russian, Konstantin Borisov in a JAXA, Japanese, Satoshi, Fukawa. All right. So there's two, uh, uh, there's actually, I think, two rookies. I think Andres Morganson has been to space before. And Jasmine will be a rookie commander again. Uh, this, uh, just like, um, uh, just like we've got, uh, just had who come back to Earth and Nicole Anupu Mayan. So, here is 
always like to remind you that one of these there's 18 artemis astronauts nine men nine women there's the women there's the gateway in the middle the uber orion spacecraft's coming up from bottom left and that is the spacex starship that has the bid to land on the moon bigger than gateway gateway is not that big folks gateway could almost fit in the the payload bay of the or it's like two two modules of the payload bay of the shuttle really and but we're thinking about landing on the moon there's the lunar module that grumman built marty winkle was all over the uh, all those lunar modules there not very big 23 feet high compared to the 200 and some foot high uh starship that's gonna also lift off there okay so uh, those fuel tanks are big and when this will happen, you know, 2026 could be reasonable, but this starship has to orbit the Earth first. So as we look at another picture of the International Space Station orbiting the Earth, a gorgeous cloud cover below, the thin blue line, the only border that matters up above there. When was the last time that we had no women in space? Okay, when did that happen? Think about that. I looked it up. I think I'm right. I'm going to guess February 2018, Marty. Five years. Expedition 5455 was all men. That's how I, how I backtracked it, was I looked at the expeditions, and I'll bet Doug Forrest would do the same. He's watching Los Angeles. Gary Gerald, Marty, Gary had a birthday yesterday. I'm putting my hat back on for Gary Gerald. I don't look at Facebook every day, but Gary, happy birthday to you. You're our favorite peanut farmer. I'm going to have some GIF just uh, for you for you today, my friend. Uh, and we had Mark UCX watching. Steve Hammer. Thank you, Steve. Hazel Banks is watching. Thank you, Hayes. Uh, Mar Martella Linda Angela Ziga. All right. Good spelling there, Marty. Bill Whiting sent us 50 stars. Thanks, Bill. The Code Blue Collective is watching. Uh-oh. Hmm, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. The Code Blue Collective. Code Blue, that's like... Uh, can't breathe. Yeah, can't breathe. Uh, uh, so uh, let me exhale a minute. Uh, Martus Kras, uh, Krasinski is watching. Mitchell Rothman. Glad that you're watching, Mitchell Rothman. That used to be my favorite cigarette in Europe. Uh, and we got uh, Tom Usiak watching, who has bragging about freezing to death in Kazakhstan in 1995 watching Norm Thagard go to space. Uh, we will post something about that later, my friend. Been busy around here. So, the last time a woman was in space was uh, uh, that we didn't have women in space. I say it's February 2018. So that's five years. Who's going to be the next woman to go to space? When is this gap going to be, you know, uh, 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 filled? Well, in june and that's going to be laurel o'hara another marine marty she's going to space laurel o'hara uh is uh going to be on the soyuz ms-24 she was supposed to launch on the ms-23 that they launched uncrewed because it's the replacement for the as the soyuz 22 that's uh has something happen to its uh, cooling system so there wasn't going to be a break in women in space but Laurel O'Hara will fill that in June, and there'll be more women after her, uh, as we'll have in, uh, in August. Uh, that'll put two up there for a period of time when Jasmine Moog Belly comes up there. So, on the International Space Station right now, floating around having a big time, is um, as we're looking at it there, our uh, seven astronauts, uh, Sergei Prokolov, Dmitry Petalin, and Frank Rubio have been up there 174 days. Uh, and then you've got uh, another Russian, Andrei Fedian, Sultan Al Nadia, Woody Hoberg, and Steve Bowen have been up there each for the last 12 days. Steve Bowen had 40 other days on two shuttle flights, back to back, by the way, 30, 132 and 133. We'll talk about Steve Bowen, the only person to fly back to back on consecutive uh, shuttles. So, 
I also, as a tease, Marty, think about this. How many women is the most we've ever had in space at once? What would your guess be, Marty? Yes, three. Three? It could be four. It could be four, and guess what? It is four. And there's the four ladies that were in space uh, on STS-131 in April uh, 2010. You had uh, the crew of 131 had docked, and that had three astronauts on it in blue. Uh, and that is, uh, that's not in blue, was the Expedition 23 flight engineer, uh, Tracy Dyson. Okay. And 131, as I consult my shuttle scroll here for the exact date. Yeah, that was April 2010, Discovery. Okay. And um, that is Dorothy Metcalf Limburger, is a, a above left, above Tracy. You see Tracy Dyson all the time on the NASA channel. She talks about the shuttle, about the station life, uh, and does a great job. Doing that, so you got Dorothy to the left. Japan's uh, astronaut uh, Nokia Yamazatsi is at the top up there, and then you've got Stephanie Wilson, and Stephanie Wilson is an Artemis astronaut there, and there she is in space 11 years ago. So four is the number of women, the most that have been up there at one time, and let and 14 is the total uh, that's been up there uh, ever, and we've got three. Chinese on the uh, uh, Tangong. So we got the seven uh, guys up there right now and um, uh, three Chinese, uh, all men. So hope that you've enjoyed me sharing some of this interesting facts and figures about our astronauts and women in space. I find it fascinating when I look into research all these backgrounds of these astronauts, how amazing they are and how lucky they are in many ways, because there's a lot of talented people that didn't get chosen. Uh, and it took lots of these astronauts, rarely they get in on the even second or third time, as we hear them talk at Astronaut Encounter about uh, times that they got uh, uh, rejected. So, Marty, we have anything else to clean up on Streamlabs program today? Uh, just Tom Celentano was watching. Who? Tom Celentano. Oh, Tom Celentano. Good for you, buddy. We're uh, grateful that everybody's watching us on YouTube and Facebook. We've monetized YouTube. Uh, so uh, everybody uh, tell your friends to do that. That's that's where everything's moving to. And uh, we take all suggestions. And I mention that if you're looking for a tax deduction here at tax season, we are a nonprofit that is rated A+. Plus with what we do with our money here. And of course, we preserve the birth of America's space age and talk about these wonderful astronauts in our community doing wonderful things every day as they, like me, Mark Marquette, want to bridge the space between us. I'll see you tomorrow with some more Stay Curious.